Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our producer class today. The goal of this class is to teach you how to produce on time and under budget. We will teach you how to stretch your precious dollars and put them in the right places to show more production value than your budget. And to quote from Maureen Ryan's brilliant book, the goal is for you to produce with integrity, respect, and wit. The outline for this class is to learn about rights and chain of title and how to adapt a film from another medium. Carol Dean will interview our prestigious guest, Alexis Kroslowski, on how to adapt your film from another medium. Our questions are related to her brilliant book, Great Adaptations, Screenwriting and Global Storytelling. Our attorney, Robert Siegel, will be on the call to take questions. Getting the rights to your film is the first step, even if it is your idea. You need to assign contracts. Lorenzo Di Stefano, director, producer, writer, will cover information on getting the rights for your material. The question for you is, do you have the rights to the material for your project? You need a legal release in writing before you start production. We ask that you put your questions in the chat box and I will ask them for you. Carol Joyce will teach us how to create a log line and how to improve the one you have. She shares information on her experiences with chain of title and shares the name of a generous donor to the Roy Dean Grant that gives great prices and excellent services. Lorenzo Di Stefano shares information on getting rights from a filmmaker's perspective and he is here to answer any questions on current projects. Carol Dean covers what the various producers do the development process, learning to say no. Let me now introduce you to Carol Dean, president of the nonprofit From the Heart Production. Carol is a producer, writer, and she and Carol Joyce manage the Roy Dean Film Grants. Thank you, Carol, for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Nahid. We're really excited to have you in our producer class today. These classes are based on the book. Producer to Producer by Maureen A. Ryan. She's an Academy Award winner as co-producer for Man on Wire. And recently, she helped produce two top documentaries, Becoming and Dick Johnson is Dead. People often ask me, what does it mean when you say develop your project? Because we have to tell a lot of filmmakers that when they apply for the Roy Dean Grant. And the answer is that this is the time, development time, is that it takes to complete your idea for your project. This is when you have a final script for your short or your feature and an outline for your story for a documentary. This development process covers the writing and rewriting of the script, as well as the names of the people that you want to interview for your documentary. And it also covers the legal steps that you must go through to purchase or acquire the underlying material, like releases and contracts, because you need those from everyone you work with. And this is where you start finalizing your financing, because once you get through this, you go into the next phase, which is pre-production. So this process of taking an idea from its original concept to the final distribution can be from two to five years. And it is really important to remember this when you set out to make a film because you need to be totally committed. Personally, I think that you need to know where you want to be in the next three years. I believe it's important to plan your future in this industry. And by doing this, you'll be able to look at things that are offered to you and make a decision if it fits your goals or not. And that's how you learn to say no to someone who's offering you something because you only want to take on projects and people who will take you to the future you want. Now, people often ask, what does a producer do? And to clarify this, Maureen Ryan, in her book, producer to producer starts with definitions of the various producers and what they do. Executive producer is the person who brings 
the financing or makes a significant contribution to the development of the literary property. The producer is the person who puts together the various elements for the project. This would be purchasing rights to the underlying material, coming up with the idea for the project, hiring the screenwriter or writing the proposal, attaching actors, creating and scheduling interviews for documentaries, hiring key department heads, overseeing the production and post-production, and bringing in financing. Now, that's a lot of work for one person, and that's why it's going to take us 26 classes to cover everything a producer does. A co-producer is the person who's responsible for the logistics of the production of the film or a particular aspect of the film. The line producer is the one who's responsible for the logistics of the production from pre-production through completion. The associate producer is the person responsible for one or more producing functions delegated by the producer or the co-producer. So one of the first things you do is rights acquisition. You need to get the rights to your material, even if it's your own idea. And our guest speaker today is the brilliant writer, director, producer, recently retired professor of screenwriting and media theory and criticism at California State University, Northridge, where she taught one of her brilliant books, Great Adaptations screenwriting and global storytelling. Alexis Krasilovsky. Well, th thank you for having me on this morning's Zoom. It's, it's such an honor to be sharing the screen today with the person who founded and runs From the Heart Productions, which has made so many producers and directors' visions come to fruition. I'm not usually a morning person. It's 9 a.m. in Los Angeles, but I'm hopeful that I can help pass the torch to a new generation of filmmakers and explain how to start responsibly and run with it. Wonderful. In your introduction to Great Adaptations, you say that this book will focus on the writing process. It's not just about adapting novels or nonfiction to film, however, because writers also work in television. We write webisodes and novelizations, and for our source materials, we look at short stories, comic strips, biographies, plays, and a variety of other media, sometimes more than one at a time. So for my first question, in your book, Great Adaptations, Chapter 2, Career Issues, Writers and Producers' Standpoints, you say that it all starts with rights acquisition. So please tell us your personal experience in negotiating an option agreement. Well, in, in my own personal experience, I, I've been adapting my own material as a nonfiction and fiction writer, as well as a poet. So the book that I wrote, Women Behind the Camera, Conversations with Camera Women, became the documentary, Women Behind the Camera which led to another book that I co-authored called Shooting Women Behind the Camera Around the World, and then a shorter version of the film, Shooting Women, which is now streaming on the Criterion channel. And my 2021 short film uh, called The Parking Lot of Dreams is based on some of the poems in my recent book, Watermelon Linguistics. Uh, in my screenwriting classes at Cal State Northridge, my students were writing for a grade, not necessarily for production, but I urged them to either write a film or television adaptation that was based on material in the public domain, generally 75 years after the death of the author. We'll get to more details about that later, and, and Robert can go into more depth about that if you like. But at least see if the rights are available to you, if you hope to sell your script and not just treat it as a learning experience. Uh, unless you're negotiating for permission to adapt a book that's on the bestseller list, you may not need six figures for an option. Some authors are so grateful for exposure that they'll accept a token payment. I had two students in different years who wrote A++ screenplays based on the novel Push by Sapphire. 
but they hadn't approached the author or the publishing company for an option. And so they weren't able to make any traction in Hollywood as unknown writers. The Academy Award for Best Adaptation for the movie Precious, based on Push, went to Jeffrey Fletcher. I'm happy for him, but I'm sorry for my students. Although others like uh, Minolte Vaishnav, who's writing on the CBS primetime show True Lies, True Lies, um, have been much more successful. But it really, you can't just write and be creative. You've got to know some of the business and legal aspects of all this when you start out. Wonderful. Yes, thank you. That's really good advice. All right, well, uh, let's go into the checklist you wrote entitled Negotiator's Checklist of Film Adaptations. Okay, so uh, let's go through these six points quickly, but if I speak too fast, uh, uh, please uh, let me know to slow down. Uh, I, I wrote uh, in consultation with Michael Donaldson, Esquire, who is the author of the book called Clearance and Copyright. Uh, but I warmly welcome Robert Siegel, Esquire, to chime in with any further insights. We're so lucky to have you here with us today, Robert. Point number one, uh, is the basic story under copyright? Is the basic material 75 years old or older if, catch 22, if the copyright date is stated as sometime before 1978? Or is it 50 years from the author's death date if the material was copyrighted after 1978? So for those of you who are working with material that's not published in the US, however, it's usually 70 years, not 50 years after death. So it's worth checking this out uh, with a fine-tuned comb, especially for, for different regions of the world, because point number two, the question, who owns the rights, is, is very basic, but it's crucial. In my case, I just learned last week, after spending thousands of dollars on legal fees to option a novel that I really loved, uh, that I could really see as a limited TV series, I learned that the deceased author's daughter, in going through her mother's papers, that her mother, the novelist, had given the copyright over to her publisher. Her daughter didn't even know this. Even oh. the, the, and, and the novel showed the copyright owner as the mother's name. And it would have cost me a lot more money to straighten out this entanglement with a lawyer and negotiate with the publisher instead of the daughter, as I had been doing for months, in addition to what I promised to pay the daughter for the right to adapt her mother's novel. And I'm not a millionaire, so I had to stop the option process, which should have been relatively simple, but at least I'm not going to be in development hell, development hell for the next two, three years. So Carol's advice about think about where you want to be in three years is just priceless advice. Thank you, Carol. Now, legal fees in the entertainment business uh, are very high unless you can persuade a lawyer to work for a percentage. What I generally do as a low budget filmmaker is I type out, you can laugh at me, but I'm just giving you my little no budget tip here. I type out the pre existing option agreement form. Uh, Donaldson and Khalif have one in their book, Clearance and Copyright. Mark Litwack, Esquire, also has one, I believe. And that way, by filling it out to the best of your ability, you not only learn all the details, of an option agreement process, but you also save money by coming prepared to a lawyer who can easily charge $500 and up per hour. Now, point number three, uh, have the, the question, have the rights been previously granted to a third party? Now, my book, uh, Great Adaptations, goes into all six of these points or questions in much, much greater detail than we have time for today. Um, but uh, this is not an all night or all day session, um, but here's an interesting anecdote that pertains to the title of the work that you may be wanting to adapt. And that's part of the bigger question about these rights. The rapper, 50 Cent, wanted to use the title, Things Fall Apart, for a film about a college football player. But Things Fall Apart happens to be the title of the most widely read book in modern African literature, written by Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian novelist and the winner of the 2007 uh, Booker Prize for Lifetime Achievement. Achebe's lawyers said, 
the rights to things fall apart won't be sold to 50 cents. 50 cents for even one billion dollars. Even though the novel had already been adapted as a very successful miniseries funded by the Nigerian Television Authority and as a feature. 50 Cent ended up using the title, All Things Fall Apart. That's how it got around it. The, the, uh, the item number four, uh, if in public domain, meaning uh, older than 75 years or 50 or 70 years as described earlier, public domain meaning essentially free of cost. Uh, if in public domain, have other versions been previously made and released? Now, again, I go into public domain in much greater detail in my book, but just one thing you might want to be careful about if you're thinking of producing work based on real life stories. Restating factual news from the public record is fine, but journalists' phrases can be copyrighted. So if you're relying on a particular article or book for your dialogue and plot elements, you'd better clear that with a lawyer first. The fifth one, moving right along on this list. Thank you for bearing with me here. The, the fifth one, monetary negotiation with the owner or agent of the copyrighted version. Now I offered $5,000 to the daughter of the author who had told me at first before she found out otherwise that she had inherited all of her mother's rights as an author, which was turned out not to be true. But what if you don't have that much? Uh, or the owner or the agent wants a lot more. Now, one possibility is to negotiate a percentage of net earnings, net profits, and or recoupable advances. And this might be a question, you, you might want to jot those terms down to ask Robert during her Q&A, what is net earnings versus net profits, and what is recoupable advances? It's well looking into those terms in more detail with a lawyer and determining the range of possibilities for a specific project that you might have in mind. Uh -huh, finally, uh, uh, non-monetary negotiations. These can include a lot of different points. Uh, so let me, let me see if I can race through some of them. Uh, a, a given one, a given territory such as the US plus options for further territories such as the rest of North America, Canada, Mexico, Europe, Asia, Africa, etc. Two would be specifying the type of film rights granted. Is it feature? Is it animation? Is it documentary? Etc. Three, media rights granted. Are you sticking to theatrical? Is it festival only and or TV? Or are you also thinking of new media? And I would strongly advise in this day and age to put in quote, all media now or hereafter known, end quote, which covers media that hasn't been invented yet. Four, script approval. Will reasonable approval uh, by the author or the agent be enough? Or, uh, and will you want to specify a deadline for that approval so they can't keep you hanging on a release date, especially for Sundance, for example? Five, will the rights allow, will the right, right, will, the rights lapse if you don't complete and distribute the film within a given time deadline. Six, limited grant of option, which specifies dates by which different stages of, towards active production must be achieved, or else your rights are gonna lapse unless you negotiate for a further option for extending the time. And this can be really important if if you know you're about to go into pre-production and suddenly you you or your family members have health problems or other projects suddenly take priority and then how much would you be willing to pay for extending that option so if you pre-think in advance that kind of a situation you are going to be protected seven has to do with sequel rights characters and our basic plot rights and which is the for example, as the case of the film, The Fugitive, which was based on characters created for TV in the 1950s. And this became just as important, those TV characters, as the fact that The Fugitive was actually loosely based on the novel Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, which was written in the 19th century, way back in the 19th century, and therefore clearly under public domain. And then finally, 
Number eight, uh, screen credits to the author of the story. How big are those credits going to be? Where are they going to be placed in the film or the TV series credit sequence? Got it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alexa. That's a lot to know. So let's go to the ethics and aesthetics of adaptation. In chapter three, this is where you ask some really important questions, like why are you the one who can best retell this story? What are your motives? And will the work do justice to the original author or to a discerning audience of a more demanding era? So let's uh, hear some of these issues, please. Okay, so in my book, uh, Great Adaptations, I tell the story of Barry Jenkins' film, the film that won an Oscar called Moonlight. It was based on an unproduced piece of writing that was not quite a play, but it was written by a playwright who happened to be a MacArthur Fellow, a Terrell Alvin McQueenie. Both Jenkins and McQueenie had spent their childhoods in a place called Liberty City, Florida. But there had been some talk about resetting the story in Chicago. McQueenie said, now nah, you're missing the whole point. Liberty City, Florida was essential to the mood of the entire project and the theme of the entire project. It had to take place in, a, in, in something that looked like Liberty City, Florida. And Barry Jenkins, having grown up precisely in that same place, was the best person by far to tell that story, not only because of his exquisite artistry as a filmmaking author. Now, to answer Carol's question, what are your motives? I'm thinking of the uh, recent disappointment expressed by disabled writers. Uh, I'm a member of the Writers Guild Committee of Disabled Writers. And they were very disappointed to, or we were very disappointed on discovering that the equity and inclusion executives that have been hired by studios today are going through studio scripts that are in development to make sure that disabled characters are included and that they're portrayed with sensitivity and, and accuracy. Well, I mean, that's all very well and good, but they're doing that instead of hiring disabled writers who could be making the Writers Guild minimum for their creative contributions and or revisions and are themselves disabled uh, and, and have lived those experiences that they're writing about. That's making it harder than ever for disabled writers to make a living. As a producer director, I was very influenced by Spike Lee, who hired many African Americans uh, below the line to make his features um, when I made Women Behind the Camera. And along the same lines, but for a different, in a different demographic or uh, overlapping demographic in many cases, I hired as many camera women as possible to film our scenes in over 10 countries worldwide. And similarly, um, as a producer, you may be asking yourselves, in telling your story to overcome prejudices towards a particular demographic or, com or community, are you hiring the right people to ensure that you're telling that story through a perspective that doesn't exploit them? Uh, now, in addressing the question, will the work do justice to the original author, um, or to a discerning audience of a more demanding era, I, I can't help <laughs> either putting my foot in my mouth or just giving you my honest opinion. Um, I, 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 I can't help adding, will the work do justice to the subject of the film? And my examples are the 2022 films, Blonde and Tar, which were beautifully crafted uh, there were real works of art, but they, did they do justice to the filmmaking acumen of actor-producer Marilyn Monroe for Blonde, or in the case of the movie Tar, did, it, did, did that movie do justice to the life of the Berlin Philharmonic conductor uh, Lydia Tor, who actually exists? And part of the reason I became a filmmaker myself is because I didn't want my writing to be turned inside out by misogynistic uh, directors. And uh, I believe that we live in exciting and challenging times when it's more important than ever to penetrate the truths that have been repressed in prior decades, both here and abroad, in order to preserve the planet and its peoples. Wow. 
Thank you, Alexis. All right, uh, Nahid, do we have any questions? Yes, yes, we do have uh, questions and uh, a good audience today from all over the world. I see people from South Africa, from Greece. And uh, to start off with the question, I'll start with Connie Bottinelli. She's asking, please discuss life right agreements for documentaries that will be licensed to networks and distribution. I'm going to turn my question over to Robert. Great. Oh, okay. Okay. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Just, first, let me just say about life rights. It's not like copyright or trademark where there's a specific set of rights. We kind of have life rights as a kind of a catch all term. And the reason that we have uh, these type of life rights agreements is for various reasons. One of them is we want access to the subject that they're alive, state if they've if they've passed away, we want access to their materials. We, if they're alive, we want basically to get waivers of claims so they don't bring lawsuits for defamation or invasion of privacy. So there's a lot of business and practical as well as legal reasons for having life rights agreements. And a lot, a lot of times it's, yeah, you're doing that in order to satisfy these very pragmatic concerns. And in a way, these life rights agreements are almost like of underlying properties where sometimes there's an option. But again, something like a um, a documentary, you may not want to go for, you know, a lot of reasons you don't necessarily do the typical option and purchase agreement, which you can talk about later. A lot of times you know, we try to maybe get a release so that it's a release from claims and we don't get into issues of compensation, which can be very problematical for documentaries where there are ethics issues of, do you compensate people? Do you pay them out of the budget? Do you give them back end compensation like proceeds? These are all issues that are kind of, you have to kind of contend with. Uh, so sometimes it's just a release. But again, one of the reasons we have life rights agreements is we want to maybe take the the subject or you know you know basically off the marketplace so that some the subject doesn't go and to another producer and do a competitive potentially competitive project or they can only do that after a series of year years so there are a lot of concerns that are addressed in these life rights agreements even if they're just releases um and not necessarily more formal, like acquisition of rights agreements or things like that. Thank you, Robert. So there, there are a lot of questions here. I hope we can manage to cover all of them. In case we don't, I've uh, put Robert's contact. You can email him directly. Um, in the meantime, let's go to the next questions. And uh, Adam is asking, can you talk about chain of title? What documents do I need to establish it? That's a Robert question also. Yes. Okay, well, a couple of, chain of title, it's kind of a very broad term. For documentaries, the chain of title is relatively straightforward because a lot of times, you know, assuming it's not based on a book or someone's life story or, you know, a lot of times it's just getting a series of releases from people that you're interviewing or who are the main subject. It, a lot of times, if you're interviewing people, a, a release is, you know, from claims and so forth and the right to use it in the project, the results and proceeds of the interview and other such issues. Um, uh, so if a documentary, it's somewhat more streamlined. So when it is in a narrative, a lot of times, again, we have to deal with, if you're dealing with underlying rights, are we optioning with a right to purchase those rights? And we have to get an agreement for those. Um, you know, of course, a lot of the part of the chain of title includes things like crew agreements, performer agreements, even location agreements at times. These are all the agreements that you get together because when you basically make a deal with a sales agent or a distributor, uh, they may ask for, you know, copies of all those signed agreements as a part of delivery in order to, for them to feel comfortable, A, to distribute the film 
and B, to acquire what's called errors and omissions insurance in case there are claims like copyright infringement or invasion of privacy. Yeah, and then uh, Bob, here's another one. Can our filmmakers use template for options? Carol Joyce is asking this. Uh, well, again, templates are very good guides, but I think you have to remember you're dealing with parties and parties have particular needs and interests and there's particular deal points that reflect the parties. So it's one of those, it's a good guide, but like, don't try this at home totally because you're going to be making a significant commitment in this project and spending a lot of time and money. And basically to justify that expenditure of time and money, you may have to justify the expenditure for engaging an attorney, whether it's to draft the contract, review the contract, negotiate the contract. So as they say, templates are good guidelines, but they're not substitutes for kind of the experience and uh, that an attorney brings to it a project. If it sounds like a commercial, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, we have to know the truth because one little misstep, right? Uh, there was a woman I know who had written, or she came up with a great idea to, and and uh, it was developed, a lot of money, she put a lot of money in, others did too, they developed it, and they even got one of the big studios to make uh, a trailer or a uh, film, they made the first film, but this woman did not ask for the, she didn't get her creator right, so when she first went into the first meeting with the studio, they pretended she wasn't even there, they didn't even address her, they only addressed the writer, so it's just that one thing, had she known that, she would have been able to, one, participate more, and two, get money every time one of the films was shown as a creator, it's a special title, so you really have to have, I think, when you start a film, you need a producer, uh, as a producer, you need an attorney, someone that you can rely on and trust just to answer uh, small questions that you think are small questions like this. But when you open it, it's like Pandora's box. There's so many possibilities, all right? So that's- Well, that's the, earl the, earl the earlier the better, because the worst thing is the film is done, the picture is locked and there are problems and then you have to kind of can you even un, you know unwind the project unring the bell and it becomes very very expensive and problematical yes and it's wasted energy all of this should start in the beginning that's why uh we started the whole series with the rights i think it's the most important so Nahid, do you have more questions yeah, we'll take a few more questions and then we'll go because uh, we'll go on as uh, we have a lot to cover today. So one other question here, uh, which is very interesting, comes from Alexandria Jimenez. Uh, what type of rights do I need to produce a documentary based on the life of someone? Okay. Well, again, OK, I have to do an analysis. Who is the subject? The subject is, you know, a celebrity. You know, you want to do a biography about Madonna, you want to do a biography about Eisenhower or anything like that. I mean, again, you have to remember historical figures, you know, a lot of the information is out in the public. It's not pri private facts. So you have to make a distinction between material that you can find, like from books that are, you know, again, facts are not copyrightable. You know, you can basically do that. It's the expression that is copyrightable itself. So, you know, Again, uh, you want to do something, you know, Donald Trump. I mean, again, you're not going to go to Donald Trump and get the rights. You know, again, there is that First Amendment protection. But again, you have to bear in mind that even celebrities have a private life. So you're know, dealing with private facts that are not ascertainable elsewhere, or the private facts may result in an invasion of privacy or possibly defamation or along those lines, then that's something you have to really bear in mind. Um, again, if it's someone who's not a celebrity, someone who's not in the limelight, who didn't insert themselves in the limelight, then they'll wind up in the news, then that's even more problematical because the protection that's accorded to 
basically, you know, people who tell do biopics and documentaries um, is much stronger for celebrities and people in the public, you know, public figures than it is private individuals. A lot of times that's why you have to sometimes change the names and change, you know, the information, put them in different states and have a different number of children and are they married because you're dealing with people that are not necessarily been inserted into the limelight. So those are some of the factors. Okay. And to add to that, uh, Bob, Richard Farmer is asking, and this will be a, a last question before we move on, and then we'll take questions towards the end. Uh, Richard is asking, whose rights do you need to obtain concerning newspaper articles based on real events? Well, the events themselves are generally, you know, those are facts. You don't really necessarily need to get the rights to that. However, it's the expression of the article. It's the kind of the sweat labor. If it's information that you cannot readily find from, say, other sources, then it makes more sense to try to option with a right to purchase the rights to articles, especially if the articles, uh, like books, are the one, like nonfiction books, if they're doing a lot of the research for you that you could not ascertain elsewhere. If you can ascertain it elsewhere, there's less of a need to acquire, you know, the underlying rights to this source material. But if it's something that you couldn't get elsewhere, then you should be mindful of the fact that you may need to secure the rights to that uh, source material. Okay. Thank you, Robert. I've also put Robert's contact um, on the presentation here. We'll continue with uh, our class, uh, Carol, and then take more questions towards the end. Carol, back to you. Okay, thank you. Alexis, let's get into your chapter on creative issues. Tell us about the writer as a character in the film, because you mentioned Nicolas Cage playing script writing twins in the film adaptation. Roger Ebert's review said, what a bewilderingly beautiful and entertaining movie this is a confounding story about arcade thieves and screenwriters. So the question is, how and when do you decide as a writer to be a character in the film? I, I love exploring writers as characters. Um, in writing about creative issues in, in the book, Great Adaptations, Screenwriting and Global Storytelling, I explored quite a number of films that feature writers as their protagonists. And some of these include uh, Shakespeare in Love, in which a fictionalized Shakespeare comes up with the story of Romeo and Juliet, the Australian film, My Brilliant Career, about a young girl from the outback who chooses getting her novel published over getting married, and Misery, uh, the Stephen King story, for, for which screenwriter William Goldman toned down the gore to make the film more palatable for audiences, as well as to emphasize the film's theme, which director Rob Reiner describes as, quote, a, a, a man struggling to grow as an artist. Now, when it comes to the film called Adaptation by Charlie Kaufman and his imaginary twin brother, Donald Kaufman, the difficulty of writing about orchids, the ensuing writer's block, that Charlie suffers from, the imagined love affair he has with the New York Magazine author of the a source material article about orchids, which Kaufman has been hired to adapt as part of the story of the film. These are beautifully complex in their development, especially when the character of Charlie Kaufman is pitted against the how to write a Hollywood screenplay approach of the brother totally commercial in his thinking, and he's who's swooning under the screenwriting guru, Bob McKee, whose book story is practically a Bible for most screenwriters in, in Hollywood. And if the producers really wanted to make a movie about orchids, however, they might have turned to screenwriters who know a thing or two about horticulture or whose emotions have been swayed by the beautiful visions and perfumes of flowers, although it's not smell aroma, we can smell the flowers on the screen, but we can see characters reacting to the flowers. It's, it's almost as if Kaufman, who's not a flower man, has been writing about life on Mars. But that adds to the wry humor of the film. 
Now for documentary filmmakers, which is how I've spent much of my own life, making a film is often a way of discovering the world uh, through the camera, through the connections with real people that you make in far off places. And you may ask yourself, do you want to tell a particular story that you know well, which you think will resonate with the world beyond you, which needs to be told uh, as a kind of uber auteur? Or do you want to hire a writer for hire a screenwriter who knows his or her or their craft and convey can convey the themes about which you're so passionate? And will you be a writer producer or a producer working uh, uh, as a showrunner with a room full of writers contributing their personal stories as they interface with the key themes and characters of your show? So you kind of have to be comfortable with your own needs as a creative artist. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, let's give an example of how to write a plot. OK, there are many books and screenwriting gurus who are available that specialize in plot, um, from Chris Vogler's The Writer's Journey uh, and Blake Edwards' Save the Cat and Eric Edson's The Story Solution, 23 Steps All Great Heroes Must Take, to Linda Seeger's books. Uh, such as making a good script great. And I describe plot processes in, in my book too. But one thing we know from the movie Everything Everywhere uh, All at Once, having swept the Academy Awards last month, um, is that quantum physics and non-Hollywood perspectives also have sway in creating today's plots and tomorrow's plots, thinking ahead. This process didn't start a year ago, however. Now, uh, Jean-Pierre Becolo's film called Aristotle's Plot, because those of you who've gone to film school know that your, 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 beginning, your beginning screenwriting classes almost always start with Aristotle. <laughs> but Aristotle's Plot questions the, quote, formal aspects of storytelling that go along with Western imagery through the storytelling of the film itself. And Becolo asks, does a story have to generate pity and fear also in Africa? Do I embrace this formula or do I interrogate it in order to redefine what cinema is? And some of you as creative producers, wherever you are in the world, may relish this opportunity to question the old Hollywood and Bollywood formulas and create new approaches to plot. Some of which I uh, suggest in my book's final chapter which is called Future Adaptations. Oh, wonderful. OK, so let's talk about characters and character relationships. Alexis, please. Well, I'd like to spend the rest of today, the entire day, up until midnight Pacific time in Los Angeles, talking about characters and developing character relationships with you. But if we only have a couple of minutes for this question, I'd like to defer to Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian novelist and critic I mentioned earlier, whose book, Things Fall Apart, sold 8 million copies and was adapted into a Nigerian television show and a feature. And he wrote, uh, quote, I'm quoting Achebe here, if the philosophical dictum of Descartes, Descartes, French pronunciation, I think, therefore I am, uh, represents a European individualistic ideal. I think, therefore, I am. Then the Bantu declaration, Umuntu, Nugumuntu, Nagabantu, represents an African communal aspiration. And that translates as, in English, a human is human because of other humans. And for those of us in the US and the UK, uh, television series that utilize ensemble casts, ta casts do very well by this declaration. A human is human because of other humans. You've got a whole writer's room full of different humans who are contributing their, their, their knowledge to create relationships between characters. But for too many blockbuster action films, it's still one person against the world. And as, as, as the uh, actor Jessica Chastain stated at the Cannes Film Festival a few years ago, um, she said, I do hope that when we include more female storytellers, we will have more of the women I recognize in my day-to-day -day life, she said. Those who are proactive, have their own agency, 
don't just react to the men around them and have their own point of view. Well said, yes. All right, uh, let's go to the hero's journey and the heroine's journey and talk about that, please. Uh, okay, so I, a lot of my chapter on structure deals with the comparison of the hero's journey with various heroine's journeys because there is the feeling among many women in Hollywood today that the hero's journey is a male-biased way of telling stories disguised, disguised as gender-free. And I say heroine's journey is plural because of the diversity of women's experiences throughout the world and in different ages. Um, now, in, in the book, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, the anthropologist Joseph Campbell described the 18 stages of a journey that a hero like Jason in ancient Greece must take in order to retrieve the golden fleece. And this, this golden fleece may actually have been a parchment-like ram's skin on which was written uh, an alchemical uh, secret of transforming a base metal like mercury into gold. Christopher Bogler, uh, who became an incredibly successful development executive, applied these hero's journey stages to screenwriting in his famous book called The Writer's Journey. And this has become a template for a great many Hollywood films. And it's illustrated beautifully by scenes from the 1939 film, The Wizard of Oz, and the 1977 film, Star Wars. Now, the hero's journey has served a valuable purpose. It continues to serve a valuable purpose. So it's been useful for my own stories too. I don't mean to poo-poo it, but it has been squandered on increasingly formulaic blockbusters whose special effects are only sometimes save them at the box office. And in reducing Campbell's 18 stages to 12 screenwriting steps, he demoted the meeting with the goddess step <laughs> to supporting character status. And he perpetuated a concept of journey that the, the New York Times critic Manola Dargis has called, quote, unequivocally male. In, the, in chapter eight of my book, I explore the history of diverse heroines' journeys from the story of Inanna, who was the goddess of heaven and earth, who ruled the Middle East, Mesopotamia back then, for 5,000 years, uh, to the ancient Greek stories of Demeter and Persephone, who inherited a number of Inanna's plot points, uh, to showing how Kim Hudson has adapted the 12 steps of of Vogler's The Hero's Journey to a 13-step archetypal young woman's journey that works for popular films, such as Legally Blonde, uh, and exploring the possibilities of transcultural hybrid stories, where, for example, the Hindu goddess Kali uh, might come in conflict with Mexico's uh, La Llorona or China's Golden Lotus. We can also create stories that explore women's journeys where their value is determined by themselves. These don't have to be goddess stories that women, ordinary women, emulate. We can go to the nitty gritty of what is a woman's experience. We can also deal with sisterhood stories that don't necessarily duplicate buddy stories and are definitely not hero's journeys of one person slashing through the world to triumph. We can, we can also explore stories of girls and older women who are outside the age bracket of the virgin ingenue. And instead of virgins and horrors and other stereotypes that are outfitted as archetypes, we may think of ourselves as girls and women who are deserving of rituals that celebrate or heal different stages of our lives. And these may include menstruation, sexual exploration, childbirth, miscarriage or abortion, uh, trans experiences, marriage, uh, uh, or, uh, or uh, conquering or succumbing to slut shaming, uh, disease uh, or disability, uh, coming in one's own uh, in terms of creativity or spiritual transformation, or reaching or perhaps tragically being denied a level of power whether that power is military, economic, or sexual. There are lots of women's stories that really need to be told. And the structure of these stories may not always replicate the, the hero's journey. For starters, in Sarah Poli's Academy Award-winning screenplay, Women Talking, uh, 
up on your screen right now, uh, ends with the beginning of a journey, escaping abusive men. Now, if this were a hero's journey structured screenplay, then the abuse would typically be the inciting incident, compelling women uh, to start on their journey no later than the end of act one, around 25, 30 minutes into the film. And then the cruelties of the jungle and the men and the snakes and the wild animals and the hurricanes that impede their progress would be act two. And their determination to continue on their journey would comprise act three. And their success in reaching freedom or their tragic demise in the jungle would end the film. So I hope you get this point. Oh, I do. That's brilliant. Yes, that was a great film. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's close with your chapter nine, The Process, because you have so many wonderful stories of adaptations to share with us. Well, what, what you are reading and optioning to adapt is often based on ideas and research and extensive reading itself. It's a never ending process. It's one with which it's very exciting to be involved. The first thing of, in the process is, is to fall in love with the material that you're going to adapt, or at least with its cinematic potential, because you're gonna be married to that for a good num number of years, maybe for your lifetime. What I do is I put post-its on the pages that have uh, important events that belong in the movie that you are developing in your, in your, in your, uh, in, in your mind's eye. And the pages that introduce characters and are delineated events that contribute to the main character's arc or arcs. And then I also look for, or I note the need for, if I don't find a strong one in the novel, I look for an antagonist, the evil villain, so I can trace the buildup and resolution of conflict between the protagonist and antagonist. And you're going to need conflict, by the way, in the story that you tell, whether it's a documentary or a fictional piece. Now, if there's more than one protagonist, as in a buddy story or a brother sister or a mother daughter or a father son story or, or, or women talking with lots of women um, uh, building their relationships, then, then I note the events that show the progression or the destruction of those relationships. So arcs are important. Now, you may benefit from using, uh, I, I didn't think before this started to, but here they are, multi-colored index cards. Once you're ready to put those events onto what we call scene cards, and I would use one color for the main plot, another color for the storyline B, another for storyline C, subplots, and perhaps still more to track which events involve which principal characters. And that way, you're not gonna lose sight of someone we should care about who's introduced in act one and may not reappear at full throttle until somewhere into the last act or perhaps an, another episode if you're writing for TV. So it's entirely impossible that in the process of focusing on the essential elements, of the so essential events and characters of your story, that other events and characters can be combined or even eliminated. On, on the other hand, if you're adopting a short story or an article uh, that's not too long, it's not a New Yorker article, it's just something you saw in the LA Times that goes on for like three columns, it's likely that you're going to have to fabricate additional characters and subplots to expand the story to feature length or to flesh out enough episodes for a series or mini series if you're writing for television. Don't be afraid of compression and expansion. You need to try to imagine yourself as a tailor where you're snip, snip, snipping the thread that signifies the beginning or end of a life. Now, there may be tons of backstory in the novel, not all of which needs to be in your film, although you may want to save that in your option agreement for a prequel, thinking ahead to that possibility. Or you may have to invent some of it yourself. Now, we Americans stash our elderly in nursing homes and we talk of euthanasia. We, or in some cases, we practice euthanasia in Oregon. Uh, we debate abortion. We study the embryo inside the womb. Regardless of where you choose to start and end, 
you'll want to zero in on some of the key events of your main character's life so that you'll be intimately familiar with his, her, or their deepest secrets before you begin to write your screenplay. You may even find yourself becoming a medium channeling your character's story. And once it has emotional resonance, you're ready to write it into a treatment or outline emphasizes, emphasizing what happens in the story. Now, when you have a treatment or outline in front of you, which can be anywhere from four to 25 pages or even more, it should be very easy to write the rough draft of your adaptation. And then you want to revise it to shape the script into a page turner, meaning a page turner is kind of like, it means something that whoever's reading it, hopefully a producer is going to invest a lot of money, that he or she or they are going to keep wanting to turn those pages because they're so excited about the story and they don't want to stop reading. So to, to get to that point of writing a page turner, you often have to go through multiple drafts um, so that it works as a film or television program and is no longer just a watered down illustration of a novel. And if you're working with a professional screenwriter, however, please be kind because the Writers Guild statistics show that in recent years, when the uh, writers have been asked to do so many rewrites that they're sometimes working for less than minimum wage. So think of your karma when you're collaborating with others, especially if you're writing about issues of social consciousness or producing movies about uh, that, that deal with social consciousness issues, because, so that it's embedded in the filmmaking process as well. Absolutely, yes. This is another thing you need to get in your contract. How many rewrites? All of that has to be right. So, Nahid, let's take questions. Yes, absolutely. We'll take uh, a few questions before we go to Lorenzo. Um, so, one question for you, Alexis, is uh, what is a good source to find plot, uh, plot points of heroines' journey, especially mature women? This is coming from Connie. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, what is a good source to find plot points of heroines' journey, especially mature women? Um, well, Maureen Murdoch wrote a book on the heroine's journey, um, but it, she didn't write it for screenwriters. So if you're a producer or a screenwriter, you'll have to kind of read between the lines, but she does talk about, you know, from a psychological standpoint, the, about different stages of women's lives. And I think that might be uh, valuable. I kind of would like to write more about it myself. I didn't I did refer to it in my book, but I definitely did not see it in Kim Hudson's book, which is really strictly for, it's called The Virgin's Promise. And it's strictly for the younger women that you see, tend to see in those, uh, you know, Hollywood movies that uh, don't have any clue that older women exist. So um, we may have to write more about these topics ourselves. Okay. Uh, another question, maybe this may be for Robert, but uh, let's, uh, let me ask it, is from Marianne Williams. Does the author of a historical biography own rights to the story in the book, or is that public domain? Oh, I, guess, I guess that's my question. Um, okay, when it comes to history, as I say, the events of the history are not really protectable um on the copyright and anyone can tell a story you know basically on based on historical events and that's 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 the case um my one well, very, very quickly my favorite story is amistad which is loosely based on uh steven spielberg the film uh, based on historical events and there was a character in amistad which um basically someone who wrote a story said, you didn't take that from history, you took it from my book, because that character is not, is not is based on a real person. It was completely fictitious and I made it up for my book. And that kind of led the producers of Amistad to have to settle it out. So again, the you know, characters, which are really people, you know, if it's based on real people and real events, especially if, if it's, you know, you know, basically in the 19th century or prior, those are all fair game. It's when you start getting closer to the 20th century and you're starting to deal, you know, with uh, contemporaries 
that's where you begin to have to do an analysis. Okay. Uh, follow up to that, Kremena Dost is asking, what if, uh, okay, let's look at a character, if it's um, an animal, like after an animal had served as an inspiration for a major film and franchise, it was given to a rescue. Can I make a documentary about it and mention why that animal is different to other animals, having served as an inspiration that looked just like it? Mm. The first time I ever got to ask type of question, <laughs> again, the animals, you can't defame the animal and you can't you know, invade their privacy. You know, the question is, it's almost like, you know, you know, the event, again, the animal doesn't have those rights. The owner of the animal, what rights does the owner have necessarily in the telling you know, of events about their animal? They're really, if it's events that are like available, in the, you know, uh, from newspapers or out in the public, there's not much protection that they can really be afforded. So, you know, as I say, if it's like Rin Tin, you tell a story of Rin Tin Tin, you know, that type of thing, you know, Again, the fact that Rin Tin Tin, you know, was, you know, basically was very it was a noted, you know, uh, you know, character in, you know, you can tell that type of story. The kind of the thornier issues are the surrounding issues about if you want the rights of say the owner of Rin Tin Tin, then you know you're gonna have to maybe get their rights. So you're gonna have to highly fictionalize it and go through kind of a whole process. Okay, uh, and then uh, let's take one more question and we'll get back to you, Carol. I know we are running out of time. So Megan uh, is asking a question. Do I need specific rights to make a documentary on Native American land and how do I approach the tribes? Well, that's not my area of expertise to say the least, but the the issue is really, I mean, the land, I mean, if you're telling the story about land itself, I mean, you know, the land is, you know, it, it's, you know, it's like facts, it's events. You really can't protect the land or anything like that. I mean, if you go on the land, then there's maybe property issues and location. But if you're talking about the land itself, I mean, that's something, in, you know, provided that you're not invading someone's rights, you know, you know, um, you know, defamation, anything like that, or, or, or in terms of their life story and how the highly fictionalizing that character. Again, I think it's more of a business and pragmatic issue that you may want the cooperation regarding the people of the land, or like land acknowledgments and things like that, basically from a kind of a good citizen public relations point of view than from a legality point of view of being able to tell the story. Because you could tell the story. You know, you might get flack from the tribe, basically, because you didn't consult with them. But again, that's not a legal issue. That's more of a personal business. Yeah. I, I, if, if, if I can jump in here for a second, I would strongly suggest that you contact the Writers Guild West uh, Committee of Native American Writers. Uh, and uh, that would really be a way to go. In my case, I hired as unit director, uh, producer, Christopher Garobolo, uh, who is a Yikarele Apache uh, filmmaker. Um, and uh, he knew everybody that we were going to film on the reservation uh, in the West. And, uh, and we filmed in the original Yikarele Apache language with subtitles. So sometimes making a connection and seeing who are the filmmakers uh, who are Native American, who you can collaborate with might be a, a, a good way to go. That's yeah. great. If, if, excuse me, if you can't find necessarily someone who's qualified to be, you know, to be a writer, maybe you bring in a consultant, you know, or someone who becomes you know, part of your production team. There are a lot of different ways of kind of dealing with the situation. Exactly. Um, right. I, I know um, a producer who might help you. So, um, Nahid, make sure you get her email. Maybe I can uh, introduce you uh, to my friend in New Mexico that might have some advice too, because he is uh, a Native American and a producer and he might know some of those people. Plus, do what Alexis says. That's a good uh, advice. 
So thank you, Alexis. What a great wealth of knowledge you carry. And thank you for sharing all that. So before I introduce uh, Lorenzo, I really want to invite all of you to join this producer's course we've created. I priced it very low because I honestly believe you should learn to produce your own materials. There's so many things that a producer does that normally you'll find films require two or more producers. So one of the benefits of taking the class is to learn what parts of producing you like and what you don't like. The idea is once you know how to produce from the class and Maureen Ryan's book, Producer to Producer, then you'll be able to raise money and produce your project to the level where you can attach a producer to do what you don't like, and then you can move ahead with your film. But through our nonprofit, I see a lot of great ideas and scripts, and I know that filmmakers could produce their own scripts if they learn how. So example, for a writer, it could be difficult to get an agent, or it might be difficult to sell your script. So if you spend time writing a script, the question you want to know is how are you going to get it made and perhaps the answer is to become a producer you learn how to raise money you can learn how to get attachments develop your project and then either bring in an executive producer to raise the money or an experienced producer to help you with the rest of the film now we all are reading about ai and how fast it's coming into our industry and they are saying that it will take a lot of jobs away. So how do we protect, protect our jobs? Well, one way, I think, is expand your knowledge. If you're a writer, become a writer-director. Become a writer-director-producer. If you're a writer, become a writer-producer. And this will give you more opportunity for work in the future and more control of your own product. So the second producer class we have for you is also free, and it has the famous Jacob Kruger, who shares important writing techniques for narratives and documentaries. So I just wanted to say, please consider joining for the one year price because it's not going to stay this way very long. We're going to have to raise that soon. So I wanted to give you this opportunity to join the class with the low price. And what we'll do is we'll send you Maureen's book for the first 10 people who sign up. We'll put it in the mail to you. Now, Nahid, I want you to introduce Lorenzo and tell us about his incredible film, Stairway. Thank you, Carol. Um, Lorenzo Di Stefano is a brilliant producer, writer, and director. His most recent film is Stairway to the Stars. There's a link in the chat bar. The short film won the Roy Dean Grant. It stars Quentin Aaron and the brilliant Sean Young from The Blade Runner. Lorenzo is currently working on Shipment Day, an upcoming film adaptation of his prize-winning play about the early Honolulu years of his cousin, the noted author and leprosy activist, Olivia Robello Bretha. Lorenzo, thank you for attending our class today. Welcome. I think you're on mute, Lorenzo. Uh, how's okay, that? yes. that's perfect. Welcome. Good, thank you. Go ahead. We can hear you. Well, I was waiting for a question or some kind of a direction here. It's me. I I was I muted myself. So I'd love to hear some of your experiences in acquiring rights from the filmmaker's point of view, the personal things that you go through to get rights. Sure. Um, well, you know, I've I've done three major feature documentaries, all of which are based on life rights. Uh, Talmadge Farlow, about the famous jazz guitarist Tal Farlow. Los Afiros, music from the edge of time about the Cuban pop group Los Afiros, the Sapphires. And uh, the most recent one, Hearing is Believing, about the uh, astonishing young musician and composer Rachel Flowers. 
those all involved life rights. Uh, the earlier one, Thomas Farlow, was my first major film for PBS, and I didn't know a whole lot going into that, but I found out quickly. Luckily, it was a friendly situation with Tal, who became a 20-year friend uh, after my own failed efforts to be a jazz guitar player. Uh, and Tal took mercy on me and was very lenient in terms of allowing me to tell his story. Los Afiros was a Cuban story, so I, I became uh, close with two families uh, of the living members of Los Afiros, the group of five members, three of whom had died. Uh, so that was interesting and, and tricky situation, but uh, you know, people are wary of you when you first approach them. Uh, what are you gonna do with their story as you would be if, uh, if they approached you to tell your story? Uh, and uh, Rachel Flowers uh, was an arrangement with Rachel and her mother, Jeannie, and her brother, Vaughn, to tell their story, which we shot over a period of two years. So those are all very different, uh, but similar in the sense that they're all based on real stories. Um, I've never had any actions brought against me for those or any other project. Um, narrative options, uh, a different story, as, as both Alexis and Robert have mentioned. Um, I've done a number of those from adapted from novels, uh, John O'Hara's Appointment in Samara, Cropper's Cabin by Jim Thompson, Waiting for Nothing by Tom Cromer, a number of literary adaptations, uh, as well as the Inman Diary, which I currently hold a long-term uh, exclusive option from Harvard University Press, based on the Inman Diary, a 17 million word diary, which Harvard published which I adapted for the stage uh, in uh, London and uh, in development as a five-part limited series. So those are all very different, but I've learned by doing, you know, I've consulted attorneys. Uh, Michael Donaldson, who mentioned earlier, was involved in several of my projects, still is. Uh, so yeah, that's the overarching uh, outline of my experience. So you just go in with a personal concern and let them know that you will make a film that's that has what they want to see in it. Uh, how do you uh, communicate with them to make them comfortable with you? You're talking about the living people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the documentary stakes are a little less in terms of the amount of money you're throwing at it and the back end uh, potential. Uh, and it tends to be longer processes as well. Um, I don't think you want to make any guarantees. You know, you want to show your enthusiasm uh, and your ability. And when you're first starting out, you don't have anything to show. So it's, it's pretty much just, uh, you know, uh, hubris coming in and saying, you're the person to do this. Later, after you have some films under your belt, you can show them those films and they can see the job you did on those and hopefully they'll like your approach um but uh it's it was great actually i didn't have any issues uh with complaints or concerns uh you know i'm a people person i like to be uh, delving into the stories that don't make the headlines necessarily uh shining the light on the people we sometimes miss because of the gluttons for attention who are taking all the uh, airspace and and ink uh, who I'm fairly fed up with. Uh, and so, um, like a lot of filmmakers, I'm looking at alternative subjects uh, that appeal to me. If it doesn't appeal to you, then don't even bother sharing it with others. You have to become almost a junkie for storytelling. Right, right. So you just go in and get to know them and show your heart and that you're looking to uh, tell a good story and win their uh, trust. Pretty much. That's important. Well, uh, it, what we plan with uh, Lorenzo had said in the future, he will be on every class to help you with your production questions. If you're in production, you're having a problem on the set, you can ask Lorenzo how to handle that. Uh, so we'll be discussing a lot of things over the next 24 classes. So thank you, Lorenzo. And we're going to go to Carol Joyce now. 
Uh, Nahid, you're going to introduce Carol. Yes. Uh, Carol Joyce is a director of the 501c3 nonprofit from the Heart Productions and a graduate of Brooks Institute of Photography. Carol is an award winning filmmaker for her documentary, Survivors. Carol worked with Lorenzo on his award winning short film, Stairway to the Stars, and as a LA line producer for Wheels of Heaven with Mickey Rock. Carol Joyce is currently working on the TV series called from the New York bestseller series called Area 51. Carol's additional credits are available on IMDb. Welcome, Carol. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So today I'm gonna to be talking about what a log line is. So right now I'm just gonna express, express to you that a log line is a one sentence summary of the story of your script. So major film studios such as Warner Brothers, Universal, Disney, they used to have the scripts in vaults, which they stored the screenplays. The screenwriters logged the scripts into the vault along with a log line that was placed on the edge of the spine of the script. This made it possible for studio executives to scan the scripts in the library and select the ones that matched the type of the story they wanted. Since a log line is short, it's a lot of information needs to be communicated in just a few words. So, who is the story about? What happens and who benefits? These are the three questions that are answered in the subject, verb, and direct object positions in a sentence. So, let's look at some examples. One log line is three hungover bachelors shift through the wreckage of a Las Vegas bachelor party for clues to where they misplaced the groom. Hangover. The most important thing we need to know about the who in Hangover is that they are hungover bachelors. The entire story rides on this central characteristic. What led to the hangover? What happened during the hangover? How does it turn out? The answer to these questions form the story at the beginning, middle, and end. Next, you want to know what happens. A good way to know you have a problem in your story if you're unable to answer the question of what happens. Any story that requires a description of how many scenes and events and this answers to this question in a story. This is called a unity of action. Notice that all of these verbs are active and visual. In a movie, the story can only be told through what can be seen and heard. We don't hear the character's thoughts. We don't smell what they smell. And we don't touch what they touch. We can only hear what they're saying, i.e. saving friends or sifting evidence. Our log line has been now told us that the who in the story, what the who in the story is about and what happens. So now we have to learn who benefits. In the hangover, it's the groom who benefits. With these three elements in your log line, any reader can have a really good idea what the gist of your story is. You can pitch your movie at a cocktail party or in an elevator quickly without boring your listeners. Professionals can decide immediately whether or not they want to read your script and know more. So here are a couple other things to note about a log line. A good log line reveals the genre of your script. Of course, hangover is a comedy. In a good plot, the who, the what happens, and the who benefits connect, often in an ironic way. It's the ironic it's ironic that the bachelors at the bachelor party lose the groom. This irony gives the twist to the story. A log line is not a tagline. A tagline is the line on the poster of the movie to get an audience to buy the ticket. The log line is the one sentence summary of your story designed to sell the script. In summary, a log line summarizes your story in one sentence that reveals who the story is about, what happens, who benefits, the genre, and the story's twist. All that comes together in a good log line. Well, 
we just want to thank you so much for joining the producer class today. I just wanted to let you know that I was going to feature a donor today. Well, our featured donor today is Robert Siegel. When you apply for the grant and win the grant, you get consultations with Robert Siegel. So you can learn more about him online. We also want to thank Alexis, Lorenzo and Nahid for teaching our first producer class. And I just think it was a great class today, don't you? And we hope that you come back and we'll see you in two weeks on a Saturday at 9 a.m. for class number two. So please come on board. And if you have any questions, uh, please email info at From the Heart Productions and we're here to answer them. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining our class. Our recording will be sent to everyone that registered for this class. Thank you again. Thank you, Alexis. It was brilliant. I love every minute of it. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Joyce, Lorenzo, and Robert. It was a very interesting class. And to all of you who joined us and your brilliant questions, we're all in this alone together, as Lily Tomlin says. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Support each other is the key.